and we are just so pleased to have him here as our guest speaker. Let's welcome this wonderful, outstanding gentleman, Dr. Donald Johansson. Interesting uh, that the Scopes thing will be on this evening, but uh, today is also the uh, birthday of Malthus, who influenced Charles Darwin. So it's a very appropriate day to talk about what I like to call evolution. The Brits call it evolution. I try, try to remind them that there's nothing evil about it at all. <laughs> but with their accent, they refer to it as evolution. And before I talk about uh, my favorite subject, uh, which is uh, paleoanthropology, which is not, as some people think, the study of old anthropologists, <laughs> but uh, the study of human evolution uh, and human origins. I thought I would make a few comments because I'm talking this morning with the humanist group uh, about the, the whole idea of, uh, of evolution. Uh, it really is, I think, and I like to refer to it as, as the grand unifying theory of biology. You know, there are physicists out there uh, who spend billions of our tax dollars trying to speed particles at one another in cyclotrons and so on and so forth to create, it always makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? These particles they create in these cloud chambers and so on are actually younger when they die than when they were born or something because they're going faster than the speed of light or something. That's why I didn't become a physicist, I guess. But at any rate, they're trying, as you all know, to find the grand unifying particle of the universe. Now, they can get back to about 10 to the minus, what is it, 100th after the Big Bang. And it's already too late because there's already two forces. And they're trying to find that singular force and to, to unify a theory of why the universe is the way it is and not some other way. And they spend billions of dollars doing this. Well, think about evolution in the, in, from the perspective that there was this retiring English gentleman who left England totally believing that there was some sort of creator up there that brought all this about and went out and looked at the natural world. He probably spent, you know, hardly anything on this boat with his crazy friend Fitzroy, traveling around the world for five years, and came back and contributed what all of us in biology like to refer to or understand, I, I refer to it as the grand unifying theory of biology, because nothing in biology, as Dobzhensky said, makes any sense unless we view it through the lens of evolution. And uh, the physicists, I think, have a little envy about this. They love to look at themselves as being very scientific because they can measure things and they can weigh things and they can, you know, make predictions and write equations and all these sorts of things, but they still can't get the grand unifying theory of the universe. And yet here was Darwin who, and the grand unifying theory ultimately, of course, is natural selection, which was inspired by Malthus. And it's something you can't see, you can't weigh, you can't touch. So it's an interesting contrast between the two. But this is really the, probably one of the grandest ideas, most important ideas that, that the human mind has ever come up with. The idea of descent with modification, the idea of descent from a common ancestor, and so on. But isn't it interesting that one of the most important ideas is one that seems to be so repulsive to, to so many people, and particularly when it's applied to humans. I mean, humans couldn't have got here through some process like this were divinely created. And as that bishop's wife said when Darwin announced his uh, idea, good Lord, if we are indeed descended from the apes, let's only hope it doesn't become widely known. <laughs> now, in, in, in some people's minds, okay, even if evolution were true, okay, even if it were true, how could humans okay, be anything else but the ultimate goal of the process? which is also an interesting twist that we hear. Certainly it can't be the accidental result of an undirected, possibly amoral, historical process that has no direction. If evolution were proven true, we then hear the fallback position, which is, well, then it was God's. And you know, very often I speak publicly and people say, do you believe in God? And I often answer and say, which one? But if it is proven true, if even the 
the non, and you don't have to believe in evolution, interestingly, because, I mean, how many people believe in, 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 in uh, gravity? I mean, you don't have to believe in it, right? It's a fact. But at any rate, even if, if, if people who don't accept evolution as their personal savior, okay, <laughs> are convinced that evolution is indeed a fact, then they will fall back and they'll say, well, it was God's. Is it the one on our money? Heaven forbid. <laughs> People wonder about September 11th and whether religion had anything to do with that. Here we've got money. Money that has God's name. That's only a Christian God, isn't it? Huh? It's not a Navajo God, I'll bet you it is, or a Hopi God. It's a Christian God. Anyway, God and money, huh? Great basis for belief. Um... But anyway, that it was God's way of making humans. Okay, all this probably sounds very familiar to all of you humanists. As you think about it, run into it. You run into fundamentalists who believe in the revered truth, or the revealed truth of the Bible. But there's an even more insidious group of people who we all run into, and I run into them all the time, the scientific creationists. <laughs> now here is a great group that uses this wonderful mind that evolution has endowed us with after millions of years of evolution to manipulate data to prove that the world is only 10,000 years old and that God put old rocks on the earth to test our faith. <laughs> and if you believe those rocks are old, you know where you're going. Right? This is insane. Um, it's as if there's something about evolution that's evil. As I said in my beginning remarks, in my evolution, as the words call it. There's nothing evil about it at all. We don't ask the question, is gravity moral or amoral? Is it feminist? There is a chauvinist. It's nothing. It just happens to be a fact, as evolution is. Um, science, I, I quote Ashley Montague, because uh, some of you may know this quote, science has evidence without certainty, and creationism has certainty without evidence. <laughs> think about it. Well, anyway. You all know this, that scientific creationism is one of the ultimate oxymorons. I mean, how can you be scientific if you're a creationist? And how can you be a creationist if you're, a, if you're scientific? I mean, it just doesn't work. It's like those wonderful things that come across the web, you know. Found missing. Here's another good oxymoron. Military intelligence. <laughs> Government organization. Or a definite maybe. You know I mean? just, that, that's in the same category. Now, the idea that mankind is, is a predetermined goal of evolution is one of the great myths that, unfortunately, we in the hallowed halls of academe are still fighting. Because I have colleagues who, in some anthropology departments, see evolution as linear, from ape to angel. Guess who the angel is, right? And um, the fact that there is a linear progression from something primitive to something advanced. And this, Unilin, you know, I'm writing a book review right now of uh, one of Tattersall's uh, new books, and he talks a lot about this. Steve Gould has talked a lot about it. But it is something. And you know, I keep thinking to myself, why do people seize on ideas like brain expansion, terrestriality, bipedalism, and so on, tool making, uh, as, as sort of a unilineal um, mode of evolutionary change. It's sort of as if, you know, there's this tunnel of evolution, right? We don't know exactly what happens into it, but in the one end of it steps a quadrupedal ape, and out the other end walks a bipedal human, right? Um, and that, that this was the direction. And I began to think about it, because if you, if you look at a stream, <coughs> We look at a, at a river, and I use this as an example of my class, and I draw a you know, river on the board with all the little tributaries that go out into the delta, and at the top of one of those little terminations of the delta is you. And you want to go back in time, which is what we want to do. So our perspective is looking from today pat, to the past. Well, we get into our little evolutionary rowboat, and every time we come to a fork in the, in the river, we choose the one going upstream. So if you look for the present to the past, it looks like a straight line, doesn't it? But if you were a Lucy, 
and you tried to get to that point in this delta, every time you came to a fork in the road, you wouldn't know which one to choose, would you? So that it's really a matter of perspective. And I think that unilinealism has come out of our perspective of looking backwards, rather than trying to put ourselves in the position of starting there and trying to get here. Because what we find more and more is that it was, or is, just as Darwin suggested, a tree with many branches. We're here because of the chance of survival, the chances of survival. There was no predestined course that brought us to who we are today. And that belief, or that idea, is still, unfortunately, still in the halls of um, some of the, my fellow academics. Um, we heard a little bit this morning about uh, science. And uh, I think that we, we, we must always remain vigilant about separating science from myth. Uh, it isn't always easy. Uh, as we read in the newspapers, even if a story has a myth, you know, especially if a story has a mythical quality which appeals to us at a deep psychological level and evokes emotional responses that help to identify how we feel about ourselves and the world we live in. Religion is one of the greatest examples I can think of. Um, we have our share of them in anthropology. We had the killer ape hypothesis that was inherited from Raymond Dart through Robert Ardrey. We had man, the hunter. You know, what happened to women in evolution, uh, and so on. Uh, there, and, and, and I think now we are seeing the development of a much more objective approach to understanding the human fossil record. One that moves from discovery to description, to evaluation, to comparison, to analysis. And instead of just coming up with a grand scenario, we are out now trying to actually find the alpha evidence as to how we became human. And as uh, in the book review this morning in the New York Times of uh, Wilson's new book, uh, it talks about how far behind we really are in terms of an understanding uh, and articulating a real understanding of, of what it means to be human. And um, that's why I guess we entitled the website Becoming Human, because I don't think we're quite there yet, that we still are a, uh, a in the process of becoming human. But it, it is probably one of the least well understood aspects of our existence. And it's, it, it, Wilson is much more optimistic than probably I would be about the preservation of species and of our fellow travelers in this interesting experiment called life. But uh, he does come to the same conclusion that most of us reach, and that is, is that unfortunately, because of the whims and caprices of evolutionary change, uh, we are in control. It's a little scary, especially when you drive down to ASU on 101 every morning. Those people in that car, they're all the same species, and we're all in charge. But uh, when I first moved here and got onto a highway, I thought everybody was leaving a liquor store robbery. People drive here, it's just amazing. Anyway, it's like the first time I got stopped on the highway for, for speeding, I said to the policeman, I said, why did you stop me? I said, why? I said, everybody else was speeding. Why me? He says, you're the only one who stopped. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, you know, that, that's the, the sort of background and framework in which uh, I operate. Um, and uh, with that, I thought we'd look at some slides this morning. And we, we turn off these lights, it's not going to help that much. But, uh, so we'll, uh, everything else you always want to know about sex. Looks like I brought the wrong lecture. No, <laughs> that's just to see if everybody's still awake. But you can't see it over there, can you? Can you see it all over there? We can see it almost all over there. I mean, the, you, you know, you can move some chairs in here, too. Um, Okay, here's a perfect example. Here's the perfect example. See, the scientists give it this name, hominization, as if there's some sort of subliminal process that's making us human, right? That there's something called hominization. And in fact, there's nothing like it whatsoever. The other thing that's interesting about this that I love, you, you've all seen these little walks. You're gonna, we're going to see several of these this morning. I've been collecting them. But what's so interesting about this depiction is why is it always at the pinnacle 
of human evolution is a white European male. It's always the case, isn't it? Always look at him. Just so happy to be a white European male. Of course, you never can tell in any of these things male, right? That's always hidden. That little spot. But why the pinnacle of evolution should be a white European male is obvious, right? White European males make these ideas up. And a white European male undoubtedly drew this. In fact, this is from a French book. I don't know, he looks a lot like you. <laughs> now this is the New York version of, you know, why we became human and bipedal. He's out here hailing a taxi. So I thought we ought to have our own Arizona version. <laughs> For all the golfers in the room, sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they get it right. You can see what this is. You are now entering Kansas. This is happening in uh, in uh, in Ohio now too. And then, of course, there have been a lot of misuses of, of evolution, and particularly the idea of unilinealism and the idea of the white European male. It really has its roots way back in Victorian England and even before then, because here was, out of some Victorian textbook on human variation or human races or whatever, uh, a very simple progression from primitive to a little more advanced, a little more advanced. You notice there's no white people up here, of course. Okay. To, oh my gosh, like Native American, a little bit, it's above this person, right? And then wherever this person's from, oh, this is a Mongol. Oh, I, they've got a, they, oh there's a gorilla, an Australian, a Negro, a human, an American Indian, a Mongol, and Who's the pinnacle? They're all others. I don't think there really. I don't really think there is a compromise. You know, this isn't what happened, right? But you, you, you either look at the evidence, embrace it for what it is, don't fool with it. Okay? It isn't evolution or creation or a combination thereof. I'm very much. Uh, like Richard Dawkins, um, who reviewed a book of mine in the New York Times a while ago, and he just said, you know, with, with, a, with a modern intellectual mind, you, you cannot say, oh, well, let's see now, um, if evolution is true, like gravity, now these scientists have proved this, so therefore we better embrace it and say that it was Allah's way of making humans. <laughs> you know, it's very clear that God, we are not created in God's image. God has created in our image. Again, it's a matter of perspective. Um, anyway. Proof of evolution. Brain of man, brain of Neanderthal, brain of Homo erectus, brain of ape, brain of creationist. <laughs> you know, even the Stockholm telephone book gets it correct. I was in Sweden at the, at the Royal... Swedish Academy of Sciences lecturing uh, a while back, and these are Gudna Sidra, which are yellow pages, for those of you who don't speak Nordic. And this is Slekforsning, which means genealogy. Look at page, see the archives, and look what they use as a symbol. This is, this is to alert people that there's something where you can go to the yellow pages look under genealogies and they show a picture of a chimpanzee it's just wonderful I couldn't resist taking it out of the airport uh, the uh, hotel telephone <laughs> now Charles Darwin looking very innocent here much less severe and serious as he did of course later than he did later in life and in fact I was just at his home in November with Ian Tattersall I mean you know Ian Tattersall's name wonderful books he's written. Uh, Ian is a very close friend of mine. We were in London together and he had never been to Down House, which is where Darwin uh, came up with this heretical idea that all creatures were related to one another. And um, imagine, imagine coming up with something like that. And you know why it's hard to imagine? He didn't know anything about how characters are inherited. 
He didn't know about DNA. He didn't know about chromosomes. He knew nothing about the basis, yet he came up with the idea. Now, there's brilliance. That's true, absolute brilliance. He'd sit in the back of an introductory biology class in high school, astonished today. So, um, at any rate, Darwin, of course, was the grand articulator of this idea that is perhaps one of the most robust and long-standing, because in spite of the fact that he knew nothing about the molecular basis for evolution, evolution is still, natural selection, the core of all biomedical research, for example, agricultural research, and so on. It is still, over a hundred years later, the core of biology. Dawkins and I would say that it's probably such a powerful force that if life is found, and I'm one of those people who's even more radical, I, I think we may be alone in the universe, if we find intelligent life somewhere else, I bet natural selection has something to do with it. That's how, that's how powerful, the lovely picture for Sunday morning, isn't it? <laughs> naked apes. That's where Desmond Morris, I think, got his idea. This is Adolf Schultz over here, uh, who was a Swiss um, anatomist uh, who published uh, extensively on human variation. And uh, he uh, came up with this wonderful picture. Everyone says that that's Adolf himself over here. <laughs> uh, whether he's accentuated certain features or not, we're not certain. But uh, all his girlfriends are deceased now. <laughs> but uh, once you shave the hair off and you get them all standing up in what's called the anatomical position, the, that would be horizontal. That's what you. That's what dead people are on a table when we dissect them. Their palms forward. That's called the anatomical position. So we put them in the anatomical position, and he emphasized, of course, the the view that was emerging in the 1800s that there was a close association between ourselves, evolutionarily speaking, and, you know, heaven forbid, the African apes. And um, Darwin suggested, of course, because of the similarities between ourselves and the apes that live in Africa today, the surviving few, that um, there must have been a common ancestor. And that, that was a, that's a real key to Darwin's descent with modification, that you have a common ancestor, that there is descent, evolutionary change over time, that brings about similarities, but also creates very distinctive differences. Okay. And uh, Darwin suggested that chimps were perhaps the closest living relative and that we must therefore have shared a common ancestor, and it was the process of natural selection that changed us. We didn't evolve from chimps. I you love that question all the time. You know, if we evolved from chimps, how come there's still chimps around? <laughs> we didn't evolve from chimps. You know, that's another one of these straw horse arguments that scientific creationists love to set up. Uh, chimps and we evolved from something that was not a chimp and not us. It's called a Miocene ape, which is another lecture. But something that was generalized in terms of its anatomy, but we have inherited so much of our anatomy that Darwin suggested we must have had a common ancestor. We know that there are innumerable similarities now in behavior between ourselves and the apes. Uh, Craig Stanford has a book out now. It's at USC. I can't remember the name. Anybody remember the title of the book? Uh, it's... Uh, you know, uh, written as a, as a trade book, and it talks about uh, how difficult it would be really for us to reconstruct human evolution, okay, if we didn't have chimps and gorillas living today, if they were all, all went extinct, for example. Anyway, Stanford's book points out that there are numerous similarities. You know, we always thought we were the only tool makers, right? Well, chimps make and use tools. You know, they don't go and get Black and Decker stuff, but they, <laughs> They make simple tools, and that there's this, there's sort of a continuum. But to to believe that we evolved from chimps, probably the common ancestor did those things, right? So 
Darwin suggests on the basis of anatomy, the number of teeth, and then Jane Goodall's work, all of her work on chimps at Gombe, and many other people's work on chimps show that there's a lot of similarities physiologically, and now genetically, the geneticists show us that we're about 99.9% .9 identical. We hear about cloning and everybody gets upset. When do we start in laboratories breeding backwards? Huh? We ought to be able to create a chimp out of us. Huh? We should be able to do that. Uh, so that there really is no longer, I think, any doubt whatsoever that uh, these creatures are closely related. Questions. Um, Susan asked me this, or someone asked me, you know, how does a little kid growing up in Hartford, Connecticut, insurance capital of the world, waiting for people to die, no. um, become interested in an esoteric subject like paleoanthropology, human origins? Well, I was a nerd in high school and saved my paper route money to go to the opera, for example, when I was 13 years old. Went to the Athenaeum to look at wonderful paintings. I had a mentor. My father passed away when I was two years old, and uh, my mother uh, had moved from Chicago just after, when I was about seven. And uh, we lived in a very interesting twist of fate. I didn't say faith, fate. We moved in next door to a theological seminary. And the Theological Seminary was the Hartford Theological Seminary. It was a non-denominational seminary uh, that uh, trained uh, some of my favorite people, missionaries. And uh, there was a, I was walking along one day, and there was this old man who's probably 10 years younger than I am right now. So, you know, kids years old, it's very different. The snow was like that too, right? And um, he was walking his dog, and I like dogs. So I got introduced to the quadruped first, and then the quadruped introduced me to the biped, and Paul Laser was teaching anthropology. And the reason he was teaching anthropology at the Theological Seminary was because the Theological Seminary had the best single holding at that time of any university in the United States in uh, Africanist books. And Paul was a cultural anthropologist who studied, do you think I'm esoteric, he studied the origin and distribution of the plow. <laughs> he was a classic German scholar, spoke Latin and Greek and French and German and Swedish, you know, whatever. And was a bachelor, and he kind of took me under his wing. Oh, yes. And he took me to his, his apartment, and there were books from the floor to the ceiling in every single room. And I was amazed. You know, we had we didn't even have Gideon at home in my house. <laughs> my mother believed that going to church was not exactly the thing to do. I went once and I came home from church and she said, well, how was it, Donnie? And I said, okay. She said, did they ask you for money? And I said, yeah. She says, they're still doing that. <laughs> so, uh, this part of my life does come out of my mother's. Uh, and anyway, that's a whole other so Paul introduced me to the world of the printed word. And uh, he would go off to Africa to study plows. And uh, I would take care of his dog, Buster. And Buster loved to stay in this apartment. And I used to go through all these books. And my first naked experiences seeing these wonderful books of African tribes and so on. And realizing of the diversity of human kind. You know, they all didn't, they all weren't white European males. And um, I got interested in books that had skulls in them. And a book that I pulled off the shelf when I was about 13 years old was this book, 1863. My wife gave me a first edition for Christmas last year. Of uh, Thomas Henry Huxley's book, Man's Place in Nature. Evidence as to man's place in nature. He was, as you all know, Darwin's bulldog, which meant he was the guy who went out and did what I do. Okay, Darwin liked to sit home with Emma, and uh, as close, were they first cousins? I mean, yeah, yeah, I yeah. was an evolutionist and got married to a first cousin, and all the kids were nuts. I mean, they were crazy. 
didn't understand Trinity totally. <laughs> anyway, he'd sit home with Emma. He didn't like to leave Canton. Huxley would go out, and one of the illustrations in this book that caught, that, uh, that caught my eye was very similar to the illustration you saw Schultz, but it was the skeletons. And they believed that these tremendous similarities bespoke common ancestry. And I got very interested in that idea. And uh, in 1959, in July, probably July 20th or 19th or 18th, I don't remember. But it was that time when Paul said, when I came to take Buster out for a walk, he said, I have something in the New York Times to show. And he showed me the New York Times, and there was Lewis Leakey's discovery of St. James Professor Nutcracker Man from Old Abide Gorge. I said, that's what I want to do. I'm 16 years old. I want to go to Africa, and I want to find something. And uh, he said, how can you be so sure of this? And I, and I said, well, the penultimate paragraph in Huxley's book, where then must we look for primeval man? Was the oldest Homo sapiens Pliocene or Miocene or yet more ancient? In still older strata do the fossilized bones of an ape more anthropoid or a man more pithecoid than any yet known await the researches of some unborn paleontologist. I was unborn when he wrote it. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting how one can sometimes trace what they end up doing for the rest of their lives back to a single paragraph that they read when they were 13 years old, totally receptive to all ideas, made the decision, this is what I wanted. Well, this, uh, for those of you who can see it, cheerful looking guy is Raymond Dart, uh, who was the killer ape hypothesis guy. All of you, many of you have probably seen my Nova series where we've got some old footage of Raymond Dart who believed that these were bloodthirsty killer apes who slaked their thirst with warm blood and their hunger with live, writhing flesh, and that's how he wrote. And um, that was the origins of, Dar of, of Ardry's stuff on the killer ape hypothesis. And then, of course, the reaction to that was Louis Leakey, who said that we were all really Garden of Eden type creatures, remember? Louis Leakey was this, we all come from a very cooperative past. Of course, the fact that he was preaching fundamentalism until he was 13 years old from a soapbox in Kenya might have something to do with that, which is something a lot of people don't understand. But Louis Leakey was a very religious man. And there are people who think that the reason he could not accept ape man, Australopithecus, as an ancestor was because it was too primitive, too ape-like, implied too much evolution, so that's why he was always looking for early true man or homo. It's an interesting, we don't read about that so much in the books about Lewis Leakey, but Leakey was a very interesting guy from that point of view. It influenced his life. He thought we all came from Garden of Eden, right? Didn't know about Serbo Croatia or Uganda at that point, apparently Rwanda. But um, at any rate, Dart vindicated Darwin's idea. 1924, it's a story I've written about many places, came across the Tong Child, as it's called, and called it the missing link. There's no missing link. You know, these creatures weren't on their way to anywhere. I mean, isn't that interesting when you think about it? You know, that they were as fully adapted, as fully uh, in tune with their environment much more than even we are today. They weren't sort of half here and half there. They were who they were, which is another concept that's very hard for my students to understand. They're not, they, Africanists are not thinking, when are we going to have big brains? <laughs> when are we going to make tools? They were just who they were. Uh, but he thought, he, in, in his idea, in his view, Missing Link was something that still had ape-like characters, but had some characters of modern humans today. So this was a bipedal creature. Uh, the major arena of, of research for us, um, while at South Africa is still important, uh, I'm not going to talk about that this morning, is, of course, Eastern Africa and uh, Africa's Great Rift Valley, which is this geological structure easily discernible from space uh, as one of the dominant geological features on the planet. And it, 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 the Great Rift Valley is associated with, with, with uh, very hallowed places like Olduvai Gorge, Lake Turkana, where uh, the son of Lewis and Mary, Richard, you know, you need, we, I, I'm going to put a family tree together, the Leakies, because it's very hard to keep them all straight. 
it was me, the mother? No, yeah, she's the mother, but she's the mother of Louise. Well, who's Louise, you know, and so on. So they need their own family tree. This was the, this is sort of the dynasty of East African research. Uh, by the way, I had a wonderful time with Louise recently in uh, northern Tanzania, beginning of November. Hadn't seen her since she was about this big, and now she's running her own expeditions. And um, the Great Rift Valley is really a place of, of pilgrimage for all of us paleoanthropologists to be alliterative. Um, in the sense that it, it presented a whole series of lakes and rivers and perfect places for animals to fall into and become fossilized. The geological processes of uh, continental drift, tectonic disturbance are re-exposing those sediments and the processes of erosion are doing most of the work for us. So that this was an ideal natural laboratory for us to find the earliest traces. It's also, and we should look at it more closely in the sense that it, it, it is in Eastern Africa and it is limited to, the sites are pretty much located within or immediately adjacent to the Great Rift Valley, which means that we have only a, a fragment of the snapshot of what was going on in Africa. Right, I think probably if we could look at other parts of Africa, we would find that these little uh, Lucy-like creatures, Australopithecus, were probably living all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ian and I talked about this when we were in London uh, with some colleagues at the uh, British Museum, well, it's not, it's called the Natural History Museum. It's no longer called the British Museum of Natural History, it's called the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. That tells you, doesn't it? And, um, <laughs> You ever notice in the presence of a British accent, you believe everything you hear? <laughs> you know, why this is? Why, you, know, you have a car ad for Toyota up on Bell Road. The guy's doing it. You know, you believe because you hear it with an English accent. Anyway, we were discussing the fact that probably, for a whole host of other theoretical reasons, there are probably many, many, many different kinds of species. And I suspect that if we had a more complete snapshot, Africa, we would find out that there were many more species living in uh, all over Africa. But the best we have is what we see going on in Eastern Africa, so it gives us a limited view, but it is uh, our only view. Uh, here's Lewis and Mary Leakey, and of course Mary Leakey was the one who made the discovery, but of course Lewis gets all the credit for it. This is the late European male syndrome again. But uh, it was Mary who uh, found the uh, Nutcracker Man or Zinjanthropus on July 17th, 1959, when I was 16, and uh, ignited the hominid rush, you know, like the gold rush. Everybody wanted to go to East Africa. People wanted to find fossils. And, of course, that's what I wanted to do, and uh, ultimately ended up doing that. This is a, a form of early human, which is uh, called Australopithecus boisei. It's a it's got very big teeth, a huge crest on the top of its skull. It's a specialized side branch that went extinct. It left no descendants. So a good example of the branching nature of the tree. In 1970, I was a graduate student uh, at the University of Chicago and uh, talked my way onto an expedition to southern Ethiopia, to the Omo River area just here, and had my first experience doing work in Africa. And uh, as I often say, uh, you know, once you, I don't know how many people have been to Africa in this room, been on safari, right? And sort of, you know, come back and the first thing you say, boy, I want to go back right away. It sort of gets into your blood. Well, this morning when you leave, you realize not only is it in our blood, it's in our genes, it's in our bones, <laughs> where we came from, no wonder it's familiar. Peter Matheson's A Tree Where Man Was Born, for example, he talks about that. And, uh, you know, feeling the pulse of Africa through our bare feet and all that stuff. But, uh, I took to it, and I was bitten by the bug and decided that this is the kind of life that I really enjoy. And uh, in 1970, uh, I was uh, chasing after a young French woman who I had met in southern Ethiopia, who was on another expedition. And uh, I followed her to Paris. And uh, she introduced me, uh, took me to a cocktail party. And at this cocktail party, I met a Frenchman named Maurice Taieb, and Maurice was working as a geologist up in what was truly terra incognita, the Afar Triangle. 
And at the moment, by the way, the Institute of Human Origins, we have two expeditions in Ethiopia. I just talked on satellite phone uh, yesterday to one of the expeditions, and they have found new hominids, uh, just teeth at the moment. I don't know exactly what they are or how old they are, but they're working in an entirely new area, an area where new things are being found. Uh, these are two scientists at ASU uh, in the Institute of Human Origins. And the other expedition that we're sponsoring is under the direction of our postdoc, who was an Ethiopian scholar, who did his PhD at the University of Paris, and he has found uh, a virtually complete skeleton, three and a half million years old, of a child. <coughs> Lucy's child. <coughs> so, um, and uh, he, the skull was, a, was announced last year, but he's going back, and uh, so you're kind of the first to hear about this. And uh, has found parts of the skeleton. So uh, it's very exciting to, he's working just adjacent to where we found this. Um, so this French geologist said, well, if you think the fossils are great down here in the Omo, you want to see what we've got up here in the Afar. And uh, it's interesting, there was a book published in 1935 by uh, English explorer Nesbitt, and he called the Danakil, or the Afar, is it some, the Afar people are sometimes called the Danakil people, he called it the hellhole of creation. You know, how good was that prognostication? Well, we're going to go to Hadar today, which is where Lucy was found. That's the name of the site. It's the name of a dry river that the Afar people, these are nomadic Muslims, you know, who are all very nice people. <laughs> who we work with, they all carry Kalashnikovs, they're very heavily armed. <laughs> You'll meet some of them, and it's a very interesting story. You know, how do we, infidels, work with these people, right? But Hadar has become so well known in Ethiopia as a site where Lucy was found. You find places like the Hadar Music Shop here, up in a uh, remote town in the northern part of, of Ethiopia, which is a Muslim town called uh, Asaita. And so it's written in Amharic, it's written in English, and it's written in Arabic, because it's essentially an Arabic uh, town. Hadar is uh, sort of a dream come true, because it, it uh, looks, you know, very much like my backyard. <laughs> uh, except those rocks weren't laid down in water. But uh, you see the horizontally stratified layers of rock that were laid down in uh, lakes and rivers. Uh, there are distinctive marker beds, white horizons in here, which are volcanic ashes that we can date the site with. And because of the heavy erosion due to the lack of vegetation, uh, fossils that have lain more or less in suspended animation for millions of years, we know, between three and three and a half million years, are now eroded out onto the surface for some keen-eyed anthropologist like myself to come along and discover. And um, so it was an ideal sort of setting. We set up our camp. We just closed our camp down in mid-December. Uh, we set up a little tented city like this uh, and lived. There's a river that flows by, the Awash River, which provides uh, water for us. And we live out there for two months. Uh, I'm the person you hear talking about Lucy and Sion Nova and so forth and so on. But it's really a very strategic, one of the myths of what we do is, is that we just kind of go out there wandering around aimlessly, stumbling across a skeleton in the desert. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. It's a very strategically designed, implemented, multi-international, multidisciplinary international endeavor that seeks to, to, to corral as much evidence as we can to understand what our earliest ancestors were like, what the world was like that they lived in, how old that world was, and so on. So that there's a team, an international team of geologists, paleontologists, archaeologists. Uh, this last field season we found a, in four square meters, 2,000 stone artifacts, 2.3, 2.4 million years old. The oldest, most intense occupation of artifacts so our, geo our archaeologists were excavating. Fascinating discovery because the mind-blowing aspect of it is, is that nine pieces of rock that are flaked off of a core all fit back onto that core. So that was the exact spot where someone sat 2.4 million years ago and made that tool. So you get kind of shivers go up your spine when you go out there and you look down and you see these pieces and you just realize that that's exactly where it happened. But at any rate, all of us uh, go out there, we have our own areas of expertise, 
And our goal is to understand as best we can where we came from. I happen to be the spokesperson for the group, but it's all these people who have for so many years uh, dedicated their efforts. It's a very remote, very hostile part of Ethiopia, to be sure. These are the Afar nomadic Muslim tribesmen. You know, there's not a lot of room in the Quran for this either, right? Uh, and they sit and they read the Quran and they observe Ramadan and so forth and so on. And uh, when asked about how, what, you know, I mean, what do you think about Lucy? It's wonderful. They say, oh, well, Lucy was the first Afar. And all human beings are descended from Afars. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they've incorporated it into their ideology. And uh, this is not to keep rival teams of paleontologists away. <laughs> uh, although sometimes that might not be bad. Uh, this is because we are in a remote area. We do have some lion problems. Uh, and there is a tribe across the river who also is very heavily armed and occasionally shoots at us. So, um, but here, is this amazing, right? after September 11, right? Here guys pray seven times a day. This is their little area. This is their mosque, right, in our camp. And one of the things that they chant during this um, praying in the evening, they always have their Kalashnikovs or AK-47s right there in case anything were to happen. It's a ballet the way that they carry these things. It's just amazing. One of the things that they say is they thank Allah for bringing us there to work with them. And in fact, uh, my wife did a um, some video two years ago that was shown on Channel 8, an interview with one of these primitive off our people, right, who, who says, you know, before the discovery of Lucy, we were number zero, we were, we were the last in the 50-some tribes in Ethiopia. Nobody knew about us or cared about us. And now, with the discovery of Lucy, Everyone knows we are who we are because Lucy was named Australopithecus afarensis after the Afar people. So you know, I figure if I go to a remote region like this of the world, not carry a weapon, put all my trust into the hands of nomadic Muslims and tribes, there ought to be other solutions to this problem than bombing a country into oblivion. Uh, this is the team of uh, scientists and students. We bring graduate students from ASU. Uh, we uh, work have worked with the Afar for uh, many, many years. Local people who we go back to, some of them have worked for us for 20 years as collectors, excavators, so on and so forth. And uh, we are continuing to train a number of, of Ethiopian scholars. One of them is a postdoc uh, at the Institute here in, in Tempe. Uh, so, you know, just bear in mind that I'm here this morning because I live close by, but there are a lot of other people who could tell you a lot of interesting stuff about this also. I show this uh, illustration of a, one of our lone off our standing up there, looking out into what looks a little bit like the Grand Canyon, right? You know, where do you begin to look? You know, how do you know you're going to find something? Well, fortunately, erosion does a lot of the work for us. Here you see there are four people in this picture and may spend three days in this little bowl searching. Well, erosion does the initial work for us. And bones come out onto the surface of the ground. Here's a piece of leg bone of a, a probably a hippo. This is a half a jaw of a monkey or of a um, pig here. And this material erodes out onto the surface and is very diagnostic. <coughs> if you were there for a while, you too would begin to find things. But we do carry with us in our minds, certainly, a search image of, of what we're looking for, which I think is very important. And we do it in a very systematic way. We just don't wander all over the place. We have maps, we cordon stuff off, we, we do all of this survey in a very systematic way. Uh, with very trained individuals. And each thing we find is distinctive. Here is a little piece of mandible, lower jaw, with very spiky teeth. That's a, that's a monkey. It happens to be a colobus monkey, a leaf-eating monkey. And we can tell that because of the shape of the teeth. Here is a single molar of a hippo tooth. So we know that there were hippos there. Uh, if, if you don't spot it with your eyes, some things are so big you, you, 
you know, stumble across. Right? Here is a complete elephant skull eroding out of an ancient beach sand, uh, about three and a half million years old. But the quarry that we're most interested in, at least from my perspective as a human paleontologist, uh, are the human ancestors or hominids themselves. Sometimes they're announced by the discovery of a single tooth, as was the case here. A team came in here, started excavating, there's geologists, there's screening going on, the multidisciplinary approach, how old is this, and so on. This happened to be from the lower part of our geological section. And in fact, this single tooth has led to a complete lower face of a female, which uh, Lucy unfortunately lacked. These sites, uh, again interdisciplinary, here is a anthropologist, paleontologist, and a geologist working on aerial photographs, uh, putting on to those aerial photographs the exact locations of these discoveries. Now, of course, we're using uh, innovations such as a global positioning system, the GPS system, so that localities, this is locality 58, we did label them in the field for a while, but obviously they've uh, weathered away most of them, uh, are being shot in so that eventually if someone wants to go back to these places and look for more pieces or whatever, or look at the geology or dispute the age of it or whatever, they can do this. Um, excavation is something that happens later. Here is a uh, team uh, of uh, part of the team uh, excavating. Uh, this is where these stone tools were found, but we'll also do this kind of excavation where we find bits of hominids, hoping to find more in situ. The material is all very carefully screened uh, and searched through uh, so that we won't lose uh, any fragments of these important things. And uh, they're put into primary geological context. This is a uh, notebook uh, and Polaroid photographs of a, uh, a student of ours, uh, Tesfaye Amani, uh, Ethiopian, lives in Eritrea now actually, um, trying to figure out where these things sit in terms of their relationship to these ancient channels, uh, what it says about the geological age, what it says about the environment of deposition, what it says about the association of those hominids with other animals, what kinds of paleo environment was there, and so on. Geologists, uh, Jim Aronson uh, at Dartmouth is examining uh, with a lens a piece of uh, volcanic ash and uh, looking for a particular mineral called feldspar, uh, which uh, can actually give us an absolute date, you know, which is another thing that drives the scientific creationists crazy. You know, the fact that the world is not 10,000 years old, it's billions of years old. And the kind of dating we use is, is I know, a charming slide. Um, <laughs> we'll leave it up there for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> is, is we can now determine when volcanoes erupted. For example, the volcano that erupted and left this volcanic ash, which we've given the charming name of TT4, uh, happened 3.22 million years ago, 3,220,000 years ago. That's plus or minus 10,000 years. That's pretty good. Uh, here's another volcanic ash at 3,180,000 years. So hominids, like this one, from 333 are between 3.18 and 3.22 million years. So it allows us to develop a chronology, which is important because we have about 400,000 years of time represented here, where we find off our instance, between about 3 and 3.4. And we now have about close to 400 specimens, and we are just beginning to look at micro details of microevolutionary change, and we can do that because we have a well-dated context in which to put them. And we can compare them to other sites in Africa that are dated. The site or locality that is most uh, uh, well known, of course, is this locality. This is where on November 30th in 1974, I happened to be walking along here, looking at the ground. Uh, interesting day for it to happen. It was a Sunday morning today. And it was the day after Richard Leakey and his mother Mary Leakey left our camp. They had flown up from Kenya. And uh, they left on Saturday and on Sunday they went out and found Lucy. And um, she was eroding out of this hillside just here. And I spotted a piece of elbow was the first thing that was found. And uh, of course the rest is probably very well known to most of you uh, in this room. Uh, 
loosely use it. Many things have been found that are older. There are fossils now that go back four and a half million years that are hominids. Things have been found that are much more complete. The Narakotomi boy from the west side of Lake Turkana, that's a homo erectus-like thing, much more complete. But Lucy, because of her charm, <laughs> is probably the best known discovery of, of the last century because she has this affectionate name. And uh, I was thinking about this not long ago sitting at a dinner and uh, somebody said, oh, what do you know Don is a human paleontologist? And someone said, oh, I don't know anything about that. Someone said, what did you ever hear of Lucy? It's sort of like bringing up the name of an old relative, which in fact, in a way, she is. <laughs> but uh, she's become the benchmark by which all other discoveries are judged. If, if you go back and look at your clippings in the newspapers, the, the, the new discovery that uh, Mead Leakey announced when she was visiting our campus last spring, uh, it always starts off, you know, uh, so many million years older, 100,000 years older than the Lucy discovery, or uh, compared to the Lucy find in Ethiopia, she's sort of the touchstone by which other discoveries are judged. Um, it was remarkable to find this much of a skeleton. Uh, at that point in the early 1970s, when I started my work, I got my PhD this year too, 1974. I got it in August, and when I was done with my stuffy committee at the University of Chicago, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to find something this fall. <laughs> well, there was one guy I said that especially for. Uh, but, uh, what? Yeah, but uh, the, the, at that time when I was beginning to run expeditions in Ethiopia, in pre three million year old deposit, everything we knew about human evolution that was older than three million could fit in the palm of your hand. There were a series of isolated teeth from southern Ethiopia and that was it. So to find something as complete as this had tremendous scientific import. She is still the focus of uh, paper after paper after paper after thesis, whatever it is, to, you know, now studying the little bumps on this and that. And people go and study her. She lives in a little safe in Addis Ababa uh, at the National Museum. Uh, she's one of the great national treasures, of course, of Ethiopia. And uh, what was interesting about it was that if Darwin was right, and we go back further in time, our ancestors begin, should begin to look more ape-like. Not more chimp-like, right? More ape-like. So you look at this and you look at the pelvis, and it's a pelvis pretty much like the pelvis, pelvis in this room. Okay. Uh, it's a little different. But essentially, the biomechanics of it tell us that this creature was walking upright, like we do. Cardinal feature of what it means to be in the human family rather than the ape family. The length of the arm bone this bone called the humerus is about 85 percent the length of the thigh bone now if you look around at your neighbors ours is only about 70 percent the length because we've been walking around bipedally natural selection has been kind of fine-tuning bipedalism for four or five million years so that most of the emphasis now in our locomotor system is on our lower limb right that's how most of us get around most of the time <laughs> And uh, here was a remnant of the time when Lucy's ancestors, ape-like ancestors, were living in the trees. They were using their arms as much as their legs. There were other features, particularly in the lower jaw, uh, which I won't go into, but uh, the shape of teeth, the number of cusps, and so on, that were very ape-like things we hadn't seen before. So Darwin's prediction is correct. As you go back in time, things get more primitive. They look more like the common ancestor. Uh, we knew it was an Australopithecus. It had a small brain. We only had parts of the skull, but enough to know that the brain was not much bigger than a softball, about 390, 400 cubic centimeters. An average human's brain is about 1,400, maybe 1,700. Um, but uh, 1,400 cubic centimeters, so you know, a third the size, fourth the size of an average human brain today. So we knew it belonged in the species of the genus Australopithecus, which was named by Dart in 1924. We wanted to honor the Afar people, and we call it Australopithecus afarensis. It all has to do with that esoteric study called taxonomy, how we name things. And uh, announced her in 1978 at a Nobel Symposium in Sweden uh, as a new species in 1978, and that's when the battle lines were drawn. And I lost my friendship with Richard Leakey and everybody else in the field, but at any rate. 
Uh, it was a very exciting time, obviously, for a young scholar. I was 31 years old when I found Lucy. Um, and uh, she began in so many ways to drive the scientific agenda. Here was something that, that whether you were a tooth man or a leg man, or a hip man, or a shoulder man, or a woman, there was something for you to work on. So that, uh, and, and, and to find it in a single skeleton meant we would have an image of what one of these creatures looked like that you just cannot assemble from individual finds. Um, there was this huge controversy that brewed for 10, 15 years almost as to how upright was she? Did she really walk like us? Did she spend time in the trees? You know, one group polarized over here, never went in the trees, right? Other group over here said, went in the trees a lot, right? Maybe didn't walk very well upright. And um, lots of friendships lost over that, you know, how ivory tower types are, their own brand of truth. And um, here is a quadrupedal pelvis of, this happens to be a chimpanzee, but it's not that different from your dog or your cat, who are also quadrupeds. I, weird, we're the only bipeds around except for birds and some dinosaurs. A weird motor locomotion. Huh? And um, here is a modern human female pelvis, and here's Lucy's pelvis. And I showed this at height of this controversy when people were, you know, well, how could you get a measurement like that? Your calipers aren't as good as mine, you know, and so forth. I mean, people were really getting into it. And I showed this at an international conference. And, uh, I, and, and of course, I'm on the side that she was walking up from. So I said, so here's Lucy's pelvis. Here's a modern human pelvis. Here's a quadrupedal pelvis. And I said, pelvis A resembles pelvis B, <laughs> or pelvis, you know, and they got parade upset. Because I then said something like a picture's worth a thousand PhDs. <laughs> uh, what was interesting about it was also the fact that we don't step into this tube of evolution as a quadruped and step out as a white European male. It doesn't happen like that. That not all parts of the body miraculously change at the same time. That there are certain parts of the body that change before other parts of the body. Obviously, Lucy's pelvis, a chimp pelvis, the locomotor system was something that natural selection worked on very early. It goes back about five million, four or five million years now. But when you look at the skull, it bears the undeniable stamp of an ape ancestor. Here's a modern chimp. That look, those two look more alike than this does to your neighbors. Skull. So that evolution moves in, in a mosaic way. Okay. And um, another misconception that I might talk about here is when people talk about natural selection, <coughs> natural selection can't do anything unless it's got something to work on. For that whole controversy about bipedalism, did our ancestors stand up and walk on two legs four million years ago? The immediate next question would be what? Why? So for 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, ever since people noted this difference and this peculiarity and specialty of being human, the question has always been, why did we stand up? And no one's been able to come up with an answer to that. You know why? Because it's a wrong question. Natural selection doesn't say, aha, well, I'm going to target this animal and make it upright. It doesn't work that way. What happens is that there are mutations, recombinations, variation in behavior. Some animals were walking more upright than other individuals. Okay? And because of some great survival value of bipedalism, whatever it was, you know, what was it about bipedalism that made it better adapted to that environment than quadrupedalism, natural selection now has something to work on. It doesn't create anything. The genes create it. Natural selection works on what the genes create, which has been a huge misconception among paleoanthropologists who don't read very much biology. When I talk to my graduate students at ASU, I say take more biology than anthropology. So, uh, at any rate, there was something about being bipedal five million years ago that gave us some enhanced survival value. Okay. And that's, we can talk about that. Um, so that you have a mosaic that, that the 
locomotor system changed well before the skull, uh, the brain, and so forth. Didn't all come together. Darwin got that wrong. You know, he talked about, we stood upright to free our hands to make tools. In order to make tools, we had to have big brains. Well, we did because stone tools come in the record about 2.5 million years ago. Bipedalism comes in 4 million years. For million and a half years, we're walking around bipedal not making stone tools. There's got to be other reasons. Maybe the enhanced ability to carry high quality foodstuffs back to a home base where you're sharing it with your offspring and therefore enhancing the survivorship of your genes. You know, it has a lot to do with genes, believe me. So that these creatures, very ape-like with the long gangly arms, were essentially upright and bipedal. And we know that because of these incredible, these aren't like the dinosaur footprints in Paloxy, Texas, you know, I mean, these are, these are real hominid, but this is one of the great wonders of the ancient world. This is the Mary Leakey site in northern Tanzania, Lytoli, where there are footprints left by two hominids walking along there. Astonishing. And they look like our feet. The big toe is divergent and grasping. It's in line with the rest of the foot, and the lateral four toes are shortened. So they're walking like we were. This is about this best ev the best evidence we'll ever get that they were walking upright. You know, the other thing would be the great fantasy that there is life somewhere else in the universe, and that there is intergalactic travel, and that someone from planet Zeta B came here on vacation and took video. <laughs> <laughs> that would be to convince someone. <laughs> Why we did it? Hey, look, Mom, no hands, you know? I mean, <laughs> this has been uh, mountains written about. Why would it be? No. I'm going to show you the one about the parents looking at the kid walking upright, they're on all fours, and one of them says, oh, I sure hope this isn't hereditary. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the Ethiopian government is very proud of this discovery. They call Ethiopia the cradle of humankind. Uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be there, too. Other yeah, that's me. This morning. <laughs> yeah, and, um, they've issued this wonderful commemorative stamp. They call her Dinkanesh, which means wonderful thing in Amharic. But um, she's known as Lucy, wherever you go in Ethiopia. Wherever you go. You meet kids that are named Lucy. Uh, named after... I remember I was driving in the Highlands about four years ago and we were driving through this little town of Cambodia and there was a thing called the Lucy Bar, L-U-S-S-Y. Oh. Actually, when we went in, we found it was a little more just a bar. But at any rate, we went in uh, to have a beer and uh, the woman who ran the place, uh, you know, she hadn't seen too many Ferengis, which is Ethiopian for foreigners. And, uh, I said to her, I said, you know, why did you name your place Lucy Bar? What's that name? She said, oh, there was a man who came from America many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I told her who I was. We had a picture in front of her. <laughs> so you see Lucy Bars. There's a Lucy soccer team. There's uh, a Lucy juice bar. There's a Lucy magazine. Uh, there is a, uh, oh, one of my favorite ones. It's become so well known. Paleo cocktail party. Not be Lucy. Uh, she's really become part of the vernacular, right? You know, 12 across. Early human begins with L, four letters, right? We see it on Jeopardy uh, and so on. But uh, I was up in this little remote town where I found the Hadar music shop. This is how you spell Lucy in Amharic script. Lucy Typing School. <laughs> it's just amazing. She's much more famous than her discoverer. And um, this, to, to give you a, another perspective on, you know, it's an enormous amount of effort go out there in 115, 120 degree temperatures in a search for these parts. Um, and to do it in a systematic way, do it in a way that you may not be rewarded for weeks or months or years. Uh, this is Yoel Rack down here, who is from Tel Aviv University and is a specialist of skulls. And one of the things that you may have noticed as I've 
going through this, is that we really don't have a scope of Lucy species. So in 1994, Yole went out, and at this locality, at this little hill right here, adjacent to, that's the Hadar, that's the dry river, which is called Adar in the local language. And uh, we have been driving there as our highway through the Adar since 1973. And on this slope has been a complete stop. We went by it every year, <laughs> get out of the car. <laughs> and uh, Yol was out and found a piece of the occipital, the back of the skull here. Uh, systematic excavations were done at this site. Some people were so excited they dropped everything when they heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Geologist, crazy Jim. People do go a little strange on that. Uh, we assembled several thousand pieces, and all of them are shown here. This is Bill Kimball, who is director of science at the Institute uh, down in Tempe. Um, and uh, Bill is just completing uh, one of those boring, big, you know, 400-page monographs on this skull. I, I think it will, will become the next classic in the field. This guy is was a former student of mine. He is one of the world's leading, if not the world's leading expert on cranial anatomy. And uh, we're just beginning to put these fragments together. Here is a bit of the occipital, the back of the skull. This is a cheekbone here. This is top of the skull here. This is a, the base of the skull. He's just getting some pieces to go on. And ultimately, we were rewarded with this giant monster, a huge male, three million years old, a Lucy descendant, 200,000 years younger than Lucy, a male because it's just so large and has fairly large canines, but not enormous canines. But in terms of size, very large specimen. Uh, it is uh, subsequent, where we found that single tooth I showed you, we were able to find this whole part of the face here in a mandible. And this has been put together from some other female parts uh, that have been discovered. But here's a male and a female. So there was a tremendous amount of sexual dimorphism, a very ape-like feature, as you know. Gorillas, male gorillas, almost twice the size of female gorillas. Were they harem groups? I don't know. The real Garden of Eden, I guess. Um, male with lots of females. Um, another white European male. Uh, we find out that in the animal kingdom, about 99.9% .9 of all species is the females who choose the mate. Uh, but at any rate, uh, a lot of sexual dimorphism between male and female, which suggests that they probably did interact with one another in terms of the social behavior in quite different ways from us who have much reduced. We have become actually feminized. Our canines are feminized because they're much reduced in size. Uh, not all the chauvinists like to hear it put that way. We are feminized versions. And uh, we are just finishing this monograph, which we'll hear about probably later this year. And uh, have gained much more of an insight into uh, what operances look like. This is a reconstruction that uh, a very talented fellow down at ASU did that appeared in the ASU research magazine two years ago. You can't see it, but there is a penis there on this version. The one that was published and distributed to all the people who support ASU was airbrushed out. <laughs> and I began to realize, maybe this is why they went extinct. They didn't have penis. <laughs> but uh, that was thought to be much too provocative. People who do it with the lights off. So, um, this uh, shows you, I mean, it, 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 it shows you Two of these little early hominids, long arms. This is not a tool, this is a fig. <laughs> I kind of objected to that too, but at any rate, it has certain overtones. This happens to be a fig tree. Um, because there were a lot of fig trees, and we found fossilized figs. Huh, maybe there is something to this. But at any rate, um, I'll show you what they look like. There have been much older hominids. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, at the uh, University of California has found something called Ramidus, which is about 4.4 million years old, an ancestor, probably a direct ancestor, or maybe a side We don't know. 
Uh, Meve Leakey announced her Kenyanthropus platyops, that just kind of rolls off the tongue. Uh, last year, she's also found things about 4.2 million years old called Australopithecus anamensis. How do we come up with these names? Well, anam, as you all know, is a Turkana word for lake. And it was found near Lake Turkana. Explain that. Uh, a, a sort of a more primitive version of the Lucy species. Lucy's species, Afarensis, goes back to about 3.6, 3.7. Then we've got this species. And interestingly, after the great schism between Richard Leakey and I, who haven't spoken since 1981, his wife, Meave Leakey, and his daughter, Louise, are working together with my team here in Tempe to do a comparative study over time of the relationship between these two species. It's kind of an interesting coming together again. This was the Kenyanthropus flat-faced platy, being flat, uh, that was announced when Mead Leakey was here. So the, the tree is getting much more complicated. Many more things are being found. And I don't even draw family trees anymore. I get them on a Newsweek and Time magazine. <laughs> I can't keep up. Uh, but it shows you, you don't need to remember the names of all these little creatures and what they mean and so forth and so on. But the fact is that the human family tree is getting so complicated. Did you ever have days when you wish you were a creationist? <laughs> no, it would be so much more simple. Not our lab. So the tree, just as, as Darwin suggested, is in fact one that has a root or a stem or a trunk, and that it does sprout branches. And what we have found through all of this work, whoever's discovery it is, right, that no matter where you grab a branch on the family tree, the roots all lead back to Africa, which is really interesting. Yeah. That's a Every one of us in this room is an African. Right? Right. That's an inescapable piece of evidence. The genes that are in your body right now can be traced back to the earliest appearance in Africa. We're all Africans. We just happen to have a slightly different skin color. I remember talking to one of the, you talking about prejudices. I was talking to one of the Alvar guys and asked if he ever wanted to go to Europe. He says, no. I said, why? He says, because I'll lose my color. <laughs> we're so afraid. He thinks we're bleached or something. This is we're sick. What's wrong with us? How primitive can you be that you've got this skin that has no color to it? Um, but Darwin was correct. And the tree is getting much more complicated. Uh, I lied, I do draw a family tree every now and then. But just to show you that there are so many branches that have gone extinct and have endured for very long periods of time, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and yet they faced extinction and disappeared totally. We are the sole surviving species, which makes us pretty weird. At every other cut in the, in, in the human family tree, there were contemporary species, sometimes three or four contemporary species. There's only one species today, Homo sapiens. And we probably won't speciate. We probably won't develop into species because everybody's breeding with everybody. If you realize there's 200,000 people born each day, breeding is still going on. <laughs> Alarming numbers. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you live in Australia. You can get on a Qantas airline plane and fly to Stockholm and mate with a Laplander, right, and produce offspring. The basic borders, or the basic premises of geographical isolation no longer exist. So the species is all going to stay pretty much homo sapiens. Uh, unless we do move into space, and we have a population of people uh, who are separated from planet Earth for a couple of hundred thousand years, they probably won't be able to breed when they come back. There's anyone here left to breed with them. But it's an interesting example of, of, of the fact that there's that extinction seems to be the rule. Survival is the exception. And what is also interesting is that as recently as 30,000 years ago, if we were walking in Europe, we would have seen another species, Neanderthals. So uh, this has been an interesting pruning of the family tree. Well, you know, I talk about perspective. And I talked about looking for the present to the past. Well, if you had a chimpanzee up here this morning presenting this to you, right, talking about the evolution, 
he'd give you probably a slightly different version <laughs> than the version that Homo sapiens has given you this morning. Now, he may give us that version. I'm not sure if they would have come up with the same sort of creation <laughs> that we have. But perspective is everything. And I quote uh, Pliny the Elder, ex Africa semper aliquid novi, nobody speaks Latin anymore, uh, always something new out of Africa. So at the moment we have a certain set of fossils, we have a certain set of ideas, and we have a certain set of hypotheses to test. And those hypotheses will be tested with more discoveries and application of more sophisticated techniques of analysis and interpretation. But the one inescapable conclusion is the one that I mentioned already, and that is that no matter where we sort of grasp the, a branch on the human family of the tree, whether it's Homo erectus or Homo neanderthalensis or Homo antecessor or Homo heidelbergensis or whatever, all the roots lead back to Africa, which is a fascinating perspective. It's also fascinating that all the major innovations that characterize us, upright posture, first appeared in Africa. First stone tool making, first appeared in Africa. First Homo erectus, which was called Homo ergaster in Africa, occurred in Africa, and then moved out about 1.6 million years ago. The first appearance of um, Homo sapiens, us, appears in Africa. So Africa is truly the cradle of humankind. It's where we can trace our roots back. It would have delighted Darwin to have known that his predictions that he made in the late 1800s have now been borne out by discoveries that we've had the privilege to make in Africa. Thank you very much. Africa, what explains the diversity of the physical characteristics of humans today? Well, the, the, uh, the diversity of, of humans that we see today is directly related to the fact that for a long period after sapiens arose, sapiens arose about 200,000 years ago or so, and began to leave Africa, and began to move into other regions, and there, were a, there was a combination of what's called the founder effect. In other words, if there was an island somewhere out in the Pacific that was unpopulated, and in the when we were importing slaves to the United States, was shipwrecked there, all those people would look like Africans because of the bias of the kinds of people who settled there and reproduced. Okay, so that's part of the question that there is variation in all populations. And as we move out and found new areas, it's called the founder effect, the characteristics of that population will resemble what individuals initially populated. The other thing is, is that there is variation in terms of genetic recombination and uh, what is called genetic drift that would select for uh, certain combinations that would be unique to those regions. And what's interesting is many of these regions, until fairly recently, have been fairly isolated. You didn't have Australians and Laplanders interbreeding. Laplanders married Laplanders, reinforcing that kind of physical type. Australians married Australians, reinforcing that kind of body <coughs> type, or shape, or color, or whatever. And thirdly, there are probably some microevolutionary reasons why Europeans have lost their pigmentation, which are related to survivorship and related specifically, there was an article I just saw in New Scientist the other day, uh, in terms of synthesis of vitamin D, which is extraordinarily important in our bone development when we are developing as a child. And we need high levels of vitamin D. In Africa, you have very intense sun, uh, and which is very harmful to the skin. So there is a selection probably for darker skinned individuals, whereas in Europe, 
where you have reduced lengths of days, reduced um, intense radiation, which becomes more angular because of the shape of the Earth, that there would be a selection for lighter-skinned individuals who could synthesize vitamin D from the sunlight. There may be other things that we don't understand as well that have something to do with shape of eye or shape of nose or whatever. But I think that, that, that uh, to a very large extent, we look different because we moved out of Africa as, as small founder populations that have inherited some of those features. For example, when you look at the epicanthic eye fold that you see in Asian people, where else do we find that? We find that in Bushmen in South Africa. So maybe the initial black populations that came out of there possessed that epicanthic eye fold, and the ones that settled in China inherited that and have reproduced that, and most Chinese marry Chinese, so that they've reinforced that kind of body type. Thank you. Yes? Um, I was just noticing on one of the last charts you put it, had your name on it, that last year's date, that you were still showing the endotols as being in the Direct path to people. No. Oh, you weren't? No. I pointed out that as, as recently as 30,000 years ago, they were off to the side. Oh. And they, right. you know, no matter what Uncle George looks like at the family reunion, I don't <laughs> think that we carry direct Neanderthal genes in our bodies uh, for a whole series of reasons. But most recently, of course, is the fact that we have been able to look at Neanderthal genes because we've taken genetic material out of 50, 60,000 year old Neanderthal bones, and the DNA looks different from our DNA. Um, and, and that's, a, go back to your question, I'll, I'll get, get your question, is that Neanderthals evolved in Europe because what happened was they got isolated. We, they came out as Homo sapiens. They moved into southwestern Europe, didn't foresee the glaciations. The glaciations sort of isolated them in southwestern Europe. So that, and there was an adaptation to the cold environment. Well, there's a big discussion about how much of the bodies are really adapted to cold, but if you look at a Neanderthal body, they've got short legs and short forearm segments. If you look at Eskimos, they have very short segments here and there. They're heat conservers. I'm much more African in the sense that I'm narrow and linear. I'm a heat dissipator. I do better out the gold books. <laughs> so Neanderthals got isolated and speciated into the, an, another species. Once that barrier was removed and we came into Europe, they were a different species. And I don't think we would have ever dated them. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, an article recently in New Scientist about uh, a hypothesis that seems to have been rather persistent for some time. The man at some point went through a genetic bottleneck, at which yeah. point he was a uh, semi-aquatic species. Oh. Now, because we show some uh, yeah. adaptations well, that, that make sense mostly as, as <laughs> the ocean. This, this, this is the all wet, all wet hypothesis. <laughs> there was a woman. Uh, there is a woman named uh, Elaine Morgan who wrote the Aquatic Ape. And Elaine Morgan is very well qualified to do this. And she's a screenplay writer. <laughs> uh, and um, she sees that she she believes that we evolved as in the water. What bipedalism would be doing, you know, what the benefit? We don't see a lot of fish walking around on two legs, do we? Uh, or a lot of other mam or mammals walking around on two legs in the water. We lose those features. I think if we went through, as Elaine Morgan suggests, a, an aquatic. Uh, phase, uh, we, we would look more like the mammals in the oceans than we do today. Uh, we would have lost the features that are typically terrestrial, such as bipedalism. Uh, she, she's very selective in what she chooses. It's like a friend of mine who did a spoof on this many years ago, and he published it in the Journal of Irreproducible Results, <laughs> um, in which he says that we, we actually come out of a flying background. <laughs> and uh, breasts were handholds when the little child was in the saddle, the female was flying, two legs are landing adaptations, and uh, there, we, we have this atavistic view of, you know, of how many of you had dreams where you're falling, right? This is back when you were flying. Or how many of us, you know, are really turned on by stewardesses in airplanes? <laughs> so he wrote this very fanciful article showing how you can select features and 
come up with any sort of a hypothesis. Yes. Now, this play is uh, discovered by a leaky uh, the log or? Me. Okay. Oh, that's a okay. um, <laughs> As I recall, there was like a, an analysis that there's a new species, and then, there's a, and then we got into these camps again, so to speak, because there's not enough or there's not enough evidence to, indicate, to draw such a conclusion, although she made the right. Well, where, where is that right now? Yeah. Uh, this was the uh, nature cover, the blue nature cover I showed you, of Kenyanthropus platyops, mm -hmm. flat-faced Kenyamane. And uh, this was a discovery made last uh, April. It's about three and a half million years old. I saw it, the original specimen in Nairobi this summer in June. Uh, and it, it has a, a set of uh, anatomical features in here which give it a very flat face, it's not distorted, as opposed to all these other ape men that have very projecting ape-like prognathic faces. And it's a contemporary of Lucy. Um, and it is a different species, whether it's a different genus, is, you know, how you divide up the taxonomic pie and name a new genus or a new species is always difficult, but it, it's something very different. It is not an alpharensis. My colleagues at Berkeley, they think it's just an aberrant alpharensis, and they're wrong. It's not. It is a different species. Um, I've done a, a lot of thinking in terms of um, zoogeographic questions. When we look, uh, I've been working with a woman at Smithsonian, named K. K. Barrenspire, who was actually out in the field with us in Ethiopia. And there are regions where we find the, these pockets of, of hominids. And one of them is the northern Tanzania region near uh, the Serengeti, near Ngorongoro Crater, where you find Lytoli and Olduvai. And then there's this, the Turkana Basin, which is the Omo and where Meeb and Richard would work. And then there's the Alpha, uh, which is further north in the Rift Valley. Now, what me, or what Kay has been finding in looking at especially antelopes, but not exclusively, but especially antelopes, because antelopes are very diverse. If any of you been in Africa, you know they're they're among one of the most most diverse groups of animals um, that that dominate the landscape. I mean, you know, you have little, you know, dick dicks all the way up to elands, and they are also very sensitive to environment. Some of them, like the redunsines, like the water buck and reed buck, they must drink every day. Other things like gazella, like Grant's gazelle, for instance, they get all their moisture out of eating grass. So they're not water dependent. So they live in distinctive areas. In addition to that, there are animals like Grant's gazelle and Summering's gazelle up in Ethiopia that look virtually identical to one another, but they are different species. What Kay has been finding is that these different zoo geographic regions seem to have their own distinctive um, constellation of animals, of pigs, and uh, pigs are a good example also, and, and antelopes. I think it's not impossible that hominids also underwent this regional differentiation and that. Platyops may be something that came out of an earlier version of something like Raminus or whatever, and evolved it was exclusively restricted to the Turkana Basin. So there, there may, it may very well be that when we look at Boise Eye in East Africa, the Nutcracker Man, and Robustus in South Africa, that they're very distinctive species because of geographic isolation. These creatures, I think, were not moving very long distances. Uh, and exchanging genes like, like people do today. So I think that we will see more and more species, and what becomes much more difficult is the basic premise that we know that all of them had ancestors, but we don't know if they had descendants. We don't even know if Lucy had descendants. We don't know if her species actually gave rise to us. You know, is she the mother of mankind? You know, Maybe her species went extinct. Maybe, it, maybe those populations in Ethiopia never went anywhere. And uh, that is only the, the resolution to those issues are only going to come when we find more and more specimens. Uh, the other issue uh, that, that the California group talks about is that Platyops is a single specimen. Now, it's a pretty convincing single specimen. 
uh, within the Trachana Basin, there's something called um, Australopithecus Ethiopicus, which is a big, it's called a black skull, with an enormous crest on the top of it, a very projecting face, very unusual. Uh, and it's known only from that area. So maybe there is some regionalization that went on. Um, and it's one of the questions that we're beginning to look at with Afarensis, which we think extends all the way from northern Tanzania at Laitoli, all the way up to northern part of the Afar. Is it possible that as we find more specimens, they're gonna to prove to be different species? Don't know. But uh, Platyops resides in Nairobi. Uh, well, we know that by three million years ago, we already had hominid, a hominid line fully developed. How long ago did we diverge from chimpanzees or other primates? Yeah. And do, does the DNA evidence using like molecular clocks actually support that? Same yeah, thing? The, 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 the DNA work, and, and when they look at the molecular clock, trying to project back into time if they figure that uh, monkeys arose about 35 million years ago and they're that different, if we're this different from apes, <laughs> the best guess is somewhere between six and 10 million years ago. It's unfortunately an extremely poor time in terms of geology in East Africa. There are not good sediments of those ages. So there's not really any specimens from that? So we don't have any really good specimens. We don't have, in the Miocene, interestingly, was the age of apes. And there were, today we have, we have chimps, gorillas, bonobos, which are sometimes called pygmy chimps, orangs, and gibbons. Well, back in the Miocene, we had apes living in Europe, in Asia, and probably tens, if not hundreds, of different species. Which is interesting, because when you had lots of apes, you had very few monkeys. Now we've got a lot of species of monkeys and very few species of apes. So apes have really been in decline ever since, uh, say, 15 million years ago. But we don't have good, specific candidates for that common ancestor. Uh, three questions, if I may. One is, where does your organization? You're only allowed one. This should be fairly quick. Where does your organization get its funding from? Second question is, what do you think of the demonic ma uh, male uh, concept that you're probably familiar with? I haven't read his book. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just skip that one. And uh, the third one is, on your website, becoming human, you have in the uh, culture section, uh, how do humans fit into nature? You have a couple sound clips, and one of them talk has a. Episcopal rector talking about how the fact that creation and evolution are compatible. We uh, do. Yes. And <laughs> several times. And also you have Jane Goodall saying that uh, one doesn't have to believe in evolution. She goes on to say how each person is important. Who is this? Jane Goodall. Oh yes. Well, Jane's becoming more spiritual. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, seriously, Andrew, I was very concerned by that because I was surprised. Yeah, uh, I know, uh, and, and but, but not that, just that. The other one as well. That interview that was done was just had to stay. We couldn't. Jane's interview just had to stay. But maybe if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, if you would take a look at that, because but I will look. You do have an part. Episcopal rector saying that yeah. the fact that creation yeah. and evolution are compatible. He sort of goes on about how social responsibility is good and all the rest, but I just was very surprised. Yeah, well, I, no, I will take a look at that. Um, the, uh, there was, I was going to say, and I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, what was the first easy question? The first question was, <laughs> where, where, where does your research oh, get funding from? Because where, where do we get funding? Yeah. Uh, well, the teams that are in the field right now are supported by the National Science Foundation money and National Geographic Society. And um, we also have a private board of directors who provide some funding and uh, memberships and stuff. But, but our, the real bulk of our funding comes for field work from National Geographic and National Science Foundation. Uh, our salaries are paid by, well, what they are, State of Arizona, if you all read the front page of the book this morning. Um, uh, and we have been <coughs> fairly successful over the years in continuing to get National Science Foundation money for our... Actually, if I may, one last one. Sorry. Um, if I have a daughter who's interested in uh, anthropo uh, archaeology, anthropology, and so on, if one were speaking to a young potential uh, uh, paleoanthropologist, uh, what would one recommend in terms of study in that type of thing? And, uh, is she, where is she in school? Biology. Homeschool. So, so. Homeschool. 13 years of age. But. Well, come down to the institute. Good. You know, uh, and 
talk to real user-friendly graduate students. Um, and uh, maybe get involved with the project. Thank you. You know, we're not going to take it to Ethiopia. <laughs> you know, there are lots of other things. Come and look at uh, the collections. And, um, you know, we have graduate students who come into the lab all the time, and they're always very welcome. Yes? Uh, do you believe, as uh, many people do, that we should be working as hard as we do to preserve endangered species? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you said early, very early in your talk, this is, this is a concept, and I know you have to leave soon, this is a concept that has always intrigued me, um, retro evolution, but not really. What if, and is it, probably unethical, but could it be done anyway, you were to do an experiment that would perhaps show the creationists that we are really that closely related to chimpanzees, and that is to impregnate either a female chimpanzee with human or, or a female human with chimpanzee and, and see if you could get a, a viable offspring. You know, it, it, um, <coughs> I'd love to call the offspring Link. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've asked so many people at the Yerkes Primate Research Center in Atlanta, where they have lots of chimps, gorillas, and humans. Uh, if anyone's even tried this in a Petri dish. And I, it's, you know, there's sort of anecdotal um, information but nobody has ever published on whether or not a human sperm would form a zygote with a chimp egg in a petri dish. You know, we, we do. But you, you bring up uh, one, one of the useful definitions of a species, which is the reproductive barrier. Because you can get a, a, a hybrid of a a zebra and a horse, and, and isn't that the example that they always give? Yeah. Chimps and humans are much more closely related. Yeah. I mean, it should be possible. Well, you know, not in a natural dead. situation, <laughs> but in, in a laboratory <laughs> setting, I would think. Right. Or, you know, like the way they do... Um, and then breed those offspring for more ape characters before you know it, you've got... <laughs> people don't <laughs> dog. Let's take one more question. I think you those burning questions. They do that in Texas. The Renaissance painting of a man's face made out of fruit and vegetables. How do you guys know that all those pieces fit into where they where you put them? Well, with the with the cranium, with the skull. And, and the skeleton, loose skeleton. Well, okay, that's a good question. Um, in the case of uh, these are these specimens are pretty rare to find. First of all, in the case of the Lucy. Skeleton. There's no duplication of two right arms or two left legs. There's no duplication inside. So we know that there's only <coughs> one part of each part of the skeleton that we have preserved. They're all fossilized the same color. Uh, each one of these areas has its own distinctive color, coloring and fossilization and so on. Um, in terms of the skull, um, you, you actually have like a jigsaw puzzle. You have joints where they fit together. Uh, the anatomical work that is done in fleshing them out is done by a group of, um, Jay Maternus is the best known, uh, who does most of the stuff for National Geographic, and John Gerchi at Denver. And they've done lots and lots of dissections of humans and apes and monkeys and so on, and see, can see mus muscle insertions on these bones and assume that the bones you know, the muscles work the same way as modern muscles, so it's modern counterparts that are looked at. Um, but in some instances, a place I didn't talk about tonight was the first family locality, 333, where we have um, now about 225 bone fragments. We can't tell what goes together because there are at least 14 or 15 individuals at that site. So we can't do it. We can do it on size. We can say that, you know, the jaw is this big and a jaw is this big. The cranial pieces, the smaller cranial pieces, probably go more with this than that. But with that many individuals, we can't sort them out. Yeah. I was just wondering on the on the possibility that the 
the, the, the sequence of, of evolution for the hominids is more like a hedge in that you have more than just one one ancient ancestor, but that the, the descendants from each of those ancestors filled various niches, uh, environmental niches, and and crossed what you think of as a as a hedge, you know, crossing over branches, not necessarily in, in terms of, of cross breeding or anything like that, but but in terms of environmental, in, in terms of a niche. Well, that's that's probably true, um, and uh, m perhaps depending on geographical location and ancestry, you might have had similar adaptations occupying <laughs> similar ecological niches in different areas that were different species. And, and that would be the crossover that I would see. And that's a good example would be Robustus and Boise. Yeah, this would be our last one. A any evidence to, su to suggest any kind of interaction between contemporary species? And perhaps you should name your next line Dawn. Don, yeah. Don and Lizzie Shaw. <laughs> I suspect that when you see, that living at the same time, you have something which is vaguely called Homo habilis, <coughs> old divide, which was Louis Leakey's first toolmaker. And you, it was a contemporary of uh, Boise, Eye, the big nutcracker man type. And they may have actually seen one another on the landscape. Um, I, 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 there's no evidence for them interacting, but you probably wouldn't find that. But if you look at contemporary examples, the, the closest example would be particularly in West Africa, where you have chimps and gorillas who occupy the same forested areas. They just don't interact with uh, where where you have larger differences between, <coughs> say, chimps and baboons at Gambi and other places in East Africa, uh, chimps will drive off uh, baboons. Uh, and uh, but but generally there's very little interaction. I think that I, I jokingly said this morning that I, when I talk about species in my classes, I wear a little button that says, "Sorry, I don't date outside my species." <laughs> Uh, which, which I, I, I think really concisely sums up the, the idea of, um, of what species are. Species are reproductively isolated groups that are not exchanging genes with one another. And um, I think that to a large extent what we see among most primates, and chimps and gorillas would be a good example, is that they, they, they have very little interaction. Thanks very much. If you appreciate the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix and would like to see more, then subscribe to our channel and check us out on Patreon. Links are in the description.